Hi everyone! For my process improvement project, I focus on production records in school food service as a way to reduce waste, save time, and increase consumption. I completed my food service management rotation with the food service director of the Lamoille South Supervisory Union, which is made up of four schools and enrolls a total of about 1,625 students. In the town of Stowe, the free and reduced rate is 14% at the high school and 19% at the elementary school. And in Morristown, it's 46% at the high school and 54% at the elementary school. On average, each, each school serves about 50 breakfasts and 120 lunches. Two of the schools use production records but don't meet all of the requirements, and two of the schools don't complete any production records at all. The outcome objectives for my project were to review the literature and identify requirements surrounding production records in school food service and why they're beneficial, and to also provide recommendations to improve the school's current practices. After some research, I discovered a lot about production records, including the requirements, as well as why they're so important. So I'm going to start by telling you about what a production record is. and it is a written record of the planned menu items that are produced each day in a food service operation. And why are they necessary? Menu production records are required by federal regulations and serve as documentation of compliance with the minimum requirements for components and serving sizes of each item for the meal being planned for a specific grade group. In order to meet the USDA requirements, three meal components must be offered at breakfast and five meal components must be offered at lunch. Now I'm going to briefly describe for you what is required on the production records. We'll start with the site information. The records must provide the date, the preparation site, whether the meals are offered or served, and it also must provide what grades are being served. As far as the menu items go, all food items and condiments must be listed using the product name or the USDA recipe number. Portion sizes have to be written using quantity, weight, or measurements. So for an example, you could either put one cheeseburger or you could put a cup of mac and cheese. Each menu item must be assigned a HACCP process number. Number one is designated for foods that aren't cooked. Two is designated for foods that are cooked and served in the same day, only going through the temperature danger zone once. And number three is designated for foods such as soup or chili that are cooked one day, cooled, and then reheated and served on a different day, making two or more trips through the temperature danger zone. The production records also must list the planned number of servings, the amount of product used, for example, 20 pounds of ground beef, the actual number of servings used, the number of leftover servings, and any production notes, as well as the daily and weekly totals. Other standard operating procedures include keeping all production records for previous, the previous three years plus the current year, having separate production records for breakfast, hot lunch, salad bar, and sandwich bars, and separating the production records into the designated grade ranges, including K through 5, 6 to 8, or 9 through 12. And lastly, the production records may be handwritten or they can be typed on the computer. As I said before, in the Lamoille South Supervisory Union, two kitchens complete the production records each day, and two of them don't complete any production records at all. <clears throat> so for the purpose of the project, I'm going to focus on one high school, these are two of the examples of the current practices at the school. On the left is the breakfast and lunch production record, and on the right is the example of the deli sandwich bar record. As you can see, a lot of information is missing, and the information that is recorded is pretty difficult to interpret. Besides being a federal requirement, there are many benefits to completing accurate production records, including reducing food loss. Food loss is defined as the amount of edible food post-harvest that's available for human consumption, but is not consumed for any reason. In the 2014 report, the USDA estimated that 31%, or 133 billion pounds of food that is produced, goes uneaten. This amounts to $161 billion a year, 
1249 kilocalories per capita per day. Another benefit to completing production records is having access to data that can help accurately forecast how many meals to produce, which in turn helps reduce food loss. Forecasting is a technique that uses past information to estimate future needs. It enables food service managers to purchase the correct amounts of food and supplies, produce the right number of meals, and schedule the required amount of labor. Accurate forecasting, most importantly, reduces chance of over and under production. Reducing food loss and having the ability to accurately forecast are just two of the many benefits that completing production records brings. During my literature review, I will look into research that backs these two benefits as well as the costs and benefits associated with completing production records. After my preceptor and I established what my process improvement project was going to be, I was ready to begin researching. Timing of the project worked out perfectly and I was able to attend a class put on by the Vermont State Agency of Education and Child Nutrition Services about properly completing production records. After the class, I was in contact with the USDA representative as well as the head of Child Nutrition Services in Vermont and was able to obtain some very helpful resources from them. In order to find the other researches for my project, I searched Google Scholar, the PubMed database, as well as the SAGE library and was able to find all of the resources I needed. It was difficult to find research about the benefits of production records specifically, but once I broadened my search to specific benefits like reducing food loss and forecasting, I was able to find relevant articles. It was difficult to find recent research, so I didn't use a specific time frame when it came to choosing articles. When I was collecting the data for the project, I used the school's POS system to collect the number of reimbursable meals as well as the number of sandwiches sold for one month, the month of February, and calculated the weekly averages. With this particular system, it's not possible to see whether the reimbursable meal sold is hot lunch or if it, the student purchased a sandwich, so the two are combined into total meals sold. Also, for the month of February, since school vacation was during that month, I took the last month in January just so I would have four full weeks. After that, I collected data from the production records for the same days of how many meals were reportedly prepped each day and again calculated the weekly averages. I used Excel to compare the total number of meals prepped to the number of meals sold. For the cost benefit analysis, I obtained the food cost for the month of February and calculated the suspected food loss based on information that I obtained from the literature. This is the data collection tool that I used to count the total number of meals prepared versus the total number of meals sold. Now I'm going to discuss the results from the literature review as well as the data that I collected. The first study that I reviewed took place in Stockholm, Sweden at two schools as well as two restaurants. For the project, I'm just going to focus on the results from the school. So at each of the schools, between 850 and 950 meals are served each day. And the focus of the research was to identify the largest contributors to food loss. For the study, food losses were divided into five groups, losses due to improper storage, preparation losses, serving losses, leftovers, and plate waste. Losses were weighed over a two-day period at each facility. The researchers discovered that an average of 20% of food that was delivered to the institutions was discarded, and that the remaining 80% was consumed by diners. In the schools specifically, 82-85% to of the food was consumed. They also concluded that a significant portion of food losses was due to plate waste. However, storage, preparation, and serving altogether equaled about the same amount of waste. This table shows the breakdown of losses in each category. At Institution A, 9% of the food was lost to plate waste, and a total of 9% was lost from preparation, serving, and leftovers. At Institution B, there was a higher percentage of plate waste at 11 percent, but less food was lost during preparation, serving, and leftovers.
Forecasting is the next benefit of production records that I researched. In order to accurately forecast meal counts, you need previous data on the number of meals served, which comes from production records. The study that I looked at was conducted at seven facilities in Southern California, and service at the facilities ranged from 15 to 124 meals per day, five days a week. The study compared five different forecasting methods for accuracy of projected meal counts, and the methods included the naive method, which is using the actual number of meals served on a day previously for the same day, three variations of moving averages, and a formula called exponential smoothing. The researchers found that the most accurate forecasting method was exponential smoothing, with the second most being moving average A, which is the average number of actual meals served at each site per day. The researchers concluded that all forecasting methods can be effectively ap applied to predicting meal demand, but in order to properly forecast, you need to have that past data from production records. The last benefit of production records that I researched is using them to track participation and increase consumption. One plate waste study that I reviewed concluded that waste is influenced by variations in the type and appearance of meals provided in appetite and in taste. An example they used was serving apple slices versus whole apples and that increased consumption among elementary students. So this is an example of something that you could write in the notes section of the production records to keep track of which students like which foods. I followed up on that idea with another study that I found that looked at the use of production and sales records to measure change in food selection. The study evaluated production records from 50 schools in Ohio and concluded that production records were a very useful tool in tracking food trends among students. This idea was also discussed at the production record class and they were advocating for the use of the notes section to keep track of food trends. The Ohio study used these two charts to show the same group of students consumed less starchy vegetables and more leafy greens in high school than they did in middle school, which provides evidence that using production records can track changes in intake and preference among students over time. This information can be used to create menus that students will like, possibly increase participation, and most importantly will get students actually eating healthy foods that they enjoy. After collecting data from the production records and the school meal counts for February, I was able to compare the number of meals prepared to the number of meals sold. The bars on the left show the total number of meals prepped that week, and the bars on the right show the total, of number, the total number of reimbursable meals sold. So you can see that a lot more were being prepped than were being sold. It equaled about 54% of the meals that were prepped were sold, and 46 of the meals prepped were leftovers. And for breakfast, the data was very similar. Again, on the left, the total number of meals prepped, and on the right, the total number of meals sold each week. Breakfast equaled 56% of the meals sold, and 44% of the meals were leftovers. For the cost-benefit analysis, I looked at the total food cost for February. Keep in mind there were only 14 school days due to school vacation, so the total food cost for the month was $5,493, which came out to about $392 per day. Using the average school food losses from the Swedish study, which was 20%, I calculated that about $1,098 of food delivered to the school in February was not eaten. And this includes preparation, service, plate waste, and leftovers. And if we calculated how much food is lost due to only preparation, service, and leftovers, it would equal about $494 for the month. These losses are pretty significant, especially for a school food service district with such a tight budget. Completing the production records accurately will help lower food costs and food losses. Again, here's an example of the current practice at one of the high schools. Of the information that is required, the only things listed are the date, the name of the item, and the amount 
that was produced, which is open to interpretation because as you can see, there are, are no units of measure on there. So these productions are certainly not, they're certainly on the right track, but they're not accurate and they could use a revamping. This is an example of what a proper production record might look like before it's filled out. When I attended the class at the Vermont Agency of Education, they provided everyone with an Excel template that used this production record. You can see that there are spaces to write in all of the information that's required. So my recommendation for my facility is to adopt the production record system that was given by the state. The current practices in all of the facilities are inadequate in regards to the federal requirements. And there are so many potential benefits that would come from properly completing production records, including properly forecasting meal counts, which in turn reduces food loss and thus reduces food costs. Each of the schools in the Lamoille South Supervisory Union follows the same breakfast schedule. So I took the liberty of preparing a universal breakfast menu production record to get all of the schools started in filling out the production records. So I filled in all the information that isn't going to change day to day to make it easier for them to fulfill all the requirements. Although it's not a requirement for the PI project, I'll also be taking this a step further and implementing an entirely new production record system for all four of the schools and will use my required in-service presentation for the purpose of teaching the food service workers how to properly fill out the production records for breakfast, lunch, sandwich bar, and salad bar. After completing this process improvement project, I've learned a lot that I can hopefully translate into a new production record system for the Lamoille South Supervisory Union. Their current practices don't meet the federal regulations set by the USDA. After researching the many benefits of properly completing production records, I found that the most prominent benefits are accurate forecasting, reducing food losses, and tracking participation. So hopefully after my in-service, the staff will be able to utilize the new system to reduce waste, save time, and increase production. Thanks for listening.